Hello and welcome to the Dino Soul for week 13, another seven curious interesting things I saw last week. Um, before we start, as you might notice, the background has changed and therefore the sound might be a little bit cranky this week because uh, I haven't got the same microphone. I am sat in a hotel in gloriously weird Austin, so hopefully it's okay, um, but if it's not, I do apologise. Uh, but let's crack on. Uh, first of all, what are Kawasaki up to at the moment? You might know them, most people will know them from their motorcycles for instance. Uh, they are also uh, making these quadrupedal robots, uh, so they have a fairly advanced um, advanced innovation department, should we say, uh, that are making, as you can see on the right-hand side, bipedal and quadrupedal robots. Uh, so this is Bex, so this was uh, based or is based on an Ibex, i.e. a goat, um, and uh, it can carry a hundred kilograms uh, of, of load, so it doesn't have to be a human, uh, it can actually just be a uh, load. Um, interesting features are it can have a replaceable head, so you can change it for a horse, and I really like that whacking great big stop button, that panic button on the side of it as well, just in case case <laughs> it malfunctions. Uh, that's a nice detail. Um, the European Union are one step closer to ratifying their Digital Markets Act. So uh, this has been going through step by step. Uh, and uh, this is one of the last steps it's got to go through. Uh, this might even become law as soon as October this year. So what it's basically looking at is the big digital gatekeepers, as they're called. So these are the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. Um, uh, these are big companies, so they have a 75 billion euro market cap. They have a 7.5 billion uh, European turnover in the last three years. They have four, 45 million monthly users, so a lot, uh, or 10,000 business users. Um, so these companies uh, can have a huge uh, influence on the market. So what this bill does, or what this uh, law will do, is will stop things like um, these big companies setting default software, uh, also giving priority to their software, promoting their own software, and also um, playing within what they call a walled garden. So they have to now play nicely with other um, platforms and technologies as well. So for instance, if you're doing a FaceTime call, then that might need to start playing with Teams anytime soon. So I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but it might have a huge impact in Europe. Uh, if you are one of those companies and you get caught flouting this law, then you might be fined 10% of your global revenue. That's not your European, that's global. So uh, one more step along that way, it is much closer. This was as of last Thursday, so a couple of days ago. Um, so it is hot off the press. Um, not so hot off the press, but still really interesting. This just uh, came up again, uh, thoughts. I haven't actually featured this exact thing before. I thought it's worth noting. Uh, so this is a study from uh, the hospital La Paz in Madrid, and it was really about uh, the computer games and their effect on reducing pain. Uh, this was a study with children undergoing, you know, quite painful chemotherapy or anti-cancer treatments. Um, and it found that if you gave them a, co a computer console or a, a game to play, uh, and you tested uh, some vital statistics, which is what this machine is doing here, uh, you actually uh, discovered that it re reduced pain by 14%, which is not insignificant, which therefore led to less uh, need for morphine, which has its own side effects as well. But what it also did is it increased what's called parasympathetic, uh, yeah, sympathetic, that's the way you say it, tone, which is how your body reacts and how it can recover from illness as well. So it basically uh, made you respond quicker and faster to getting better. So um, we hear a lot about games being bad for people uh, in certain situations, but actually they can be used for therapeutic use as well. So that's very good, like that. Um, Bitcoin, um, also got a bit of a bad press. Uh, Elon Musk had a good old kicking of it a couple of months ago, uh, basically mainly on its uh, eco uh, credentials, which it didn't particularly have, and was extolling Dogecoin, etc. cetera. Um, however, a new report has come out uh, just to show you what's happening recently to the Bitcoin energy consumption. Uh, you can see at the graph uh, at the top, um, as of probably a year ago, it's just been climbing and climbing and climbing. Uh, and this has some really um, sort of basic stats behind it now. So uh, each Bitcoin transaction, if you wanted to, tra to trade an entire Bitcoin, it will take about 2,000 kilowatt hours of, of energy to do that. Um, just to put that in perspective, that's about the same as the American household uses in 75 days. So that's what, two and a half months worth of uh, power usage. So it is huge. Um, it has a carbon footprint of the Czech Republic. Uh, it has, uh, this is a year by the way, uh, and in a year it probably also uses the same amount of power as Thailand. Um, but for one transaction of Bitcoin, um, as I say, 75 days of an average US household, but also it's equivalent of two and a half iPhones being thrown in the bin. Um, so everything that went to actually create those iPads, iPhones, um, just chuck them in the bin every time you buy a Bitcoin. So um, is this the future of crypto? cryptocurrency um, and decentralized finance. Bitcoin, probably not because of this still. 
Um, this is a really interesting study. Uh, it's the first time an insect uh, brain has been used, or at least the analysis of a brain has been used for something other than the kind of a, a one-to-one -one relationship of technology. So for instance, uh, this is a, a hoverfly and uh, it's, its brain and basically its analysis and the algorithms that go on and uh, have been used before for image stabilization, which is obviously what it does brilliantly. But actually now what they've used it for is audio. So they've taken the same sort of um, algorithms that they got from its brain brain and applied it to detecting the sound of drones up to three kilometers away. So these are, you know, electric, that sort of high pitch buzz of a drone. If you're in a military application, uh, then obviously you need to know about a drone that's three kilometers out. So that's pretty good as well. Also, if you're a commercial air, airport as well, you need to hear these as well. So um, it was really interesting the way that they're, they're sort of delving into the uh, biological world to look for algorithms that can be now applied across um, boundaries, shall we say. So um, there was a really famous study a while ago with pigeons, for instance, the way their eyes work. Uh, pigeons can um, actually detect cancer far better than some uh, somebody who's trained to do it, so a professional. So uh, it's just the way their eyes work. So things like that, I think will we'll, it's going to be a really interesting treasure trove um, for algorithms in the future. Uh, talking about algorithms, uh, this is uh, really interesting research about uh, what initially was about sort of pose estimation. So pose estimation is really interesting. So when somebody moves or something moves, how can you estimate where it's going to be next and therefore have a better, uh, more accurate result? Um, so that's going on here anyway. But what they're also doing is they're um, highlighting things in video just using semantic lookup. So using words, so show me, for instance, a skateboard being ridden by a person. It can find that and it can highlight it. Likewise, you know, on a white co uh, cockatoo, a green parrot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, this semantic lookup, as it's called, has uh, really taken leaps and bounds forwards. Um, so. Uh, there you go. Uh, if you are going to be searching for something in the future, you might be able to search for it just using a sentence, i.e. your words, uh, and it can exactly highlight where that is and track it throughout a video, not just sort of find one frame in it and put a box around it. So that's kind of exciting. And finally, we have Zoom. Um, so Zoom, uh, I don't quite understand why big tech giants keep doing this. Um, however, we apparently need uh, even more face avatars. Um, so um, <laughs> we've seen Apple do this, obviously, and nobody used them. And now we're seeing Zoom do it, and nobody will use them. However, that's not really why I'm showing it. But um, if you do have the beta of Zoom that has it on it, then crack on. Um, but what I thought was really interesting in this is uh, Zoom have had a slightly checkered past um, being basically uh, accused of um, not not having the greatest security behind their video, but now what this really is saying to me that what they're also doing is they're they're quite closely tracking your facial features, uh, your eyes, your nose, your expressions, your uh, your basically your emotions, uh, and also possibly your body tracking as well. So. Um, you know, what do you want from your video conferencing application? Uh, do you want um, very detailed tracking or do you want the minimum of that and high security? So uh, not to say that it is doing anything with, with this, of course I'm not saying that, but just thought it's interesting the way the more features we're adding to these, the more it's actually delving into the video stream and then that analyzing what's in front of it. So there you go. Uh, that's it for this week. Hopefully that was useful. Hopefully it was interesting. Um, hopefully the sound wasn't too bad. I do apologize again. Um, I will probably do this again from Dallas next week. So uh, if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and I'll see you next week.